morning <coughs> um, Today we are shifting gears entirely and um, going to start talking about e-cigarettes and whether we want to do something more in the state about that. And to and um, the chair thought it would be appropriate to sort of understand the landscape. And for that purpose, we have invited the Commissioner of Health to come and, um, and talk to us about what we know about electronic cigarettes. Super. Um, the first time, go ahead. Oh, can you do it in half now? Okay. <laughs> Um, I'll do my editorial comments in the beginning. So I'm Commissioner of Health, Mark Levine. Um, the talk is labeled Electronic Vaping Systems and Public Health Crisis. Oh, excuse me for a minute. So, Commissioner, this is your first time here this year. Perhaps yes. we should introduce ourselves to you. That's fine with me, too. All right, so we'll go around the table. Logan Nicole from Ludlow, uh, representing the Holiday Mary Beth Redmond, representing Essex, the town outside of the village. Carl Rosenquist representing the town of Georgia. Jessica Brunstead and uh, I represent Shelburne and St. George. <coughs> and me. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy Haas representing Rochester, Bethel, Stockbridge, and Pittsfield. Chopper and Fauna represent Barry Town. Uh, Teresa Wood and I represent Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Buell Score. Dan Noyes, Wolcott, High Park, Johnson, and Belvedere. James Gregoire, Fairfield, Bunch, and Bakersfield. Thank you. So you may hear other terms used besides electronic vaping systems. Uh, a newer term that's fondly been embraced by some is ENDS, electronic nicotine delivery systems. Um, so it's all about vaping, and it truly is a public health crisis. Um, the um, advertisement for the talk was this was science, and it will be science, but not intimidating science, uh, but important science. The other thing is that um, I've delivered similar talks now quite a few times around the state because it turns out uh, school systems are very eager to hear about this because they are absolutely terrified, petrified, um, frustrated, um, and pretty much just really concerned about what has been labeled, as you'll see, a true epidemic um, in their systems. So, yeah. when we talk about epidemics in public health, we're usually talking about a small number of cases. So if there were a few cases of Ebola or uh, Zika in our state of Vermont, that would be an epidemic. Um, CDC says there was a 680% increase in that six year period in teen use. We don't see those kinds of numbers. That's like astounding. Now, we have made incredible progress in um, decreasing smoking rates, both in adults and in youth. So right now in 2017 numbers have leveled off at about 12%, sorry, 9% for youth for the now termed combustible cigarettes uh, because they must be differentiated from these newer forms. But you'll see that the rate in electronic vaping systems is 12%. <coughs> To give you another astounding statistic, 75% increase in just a one-year period, according to the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which um, was quoted by the FDA uh, commissioner, Gottlieb, uh, when he suddenly became very, very concerned about uh, this epidemic. The things that are really of major concern with the Juul epidemic, and Juul is a brand name, but it's now a part of the lexicon because people are jeweling. Uh, so it's kind of like Kleenex is one type of tissue, but everybody says give me a Kleenex. Uh, so jeweling is uh, sort of taking over the industry, but there are competitors that are doing okay as well. Um, and that is the form of these electronic nicotine delivery systems that middle and high school students are using. 
and that form um, is fairly non-obtrusive. Um, is not like you may have seen pictures of these, you know, elaborate uh, devices that deliver uh, nicotine electronically. But the Juul device, which I'll pass around because I'm sure not every one of you has seen it, is cool. And if you were in the high school years, you would say, this is a cool thing. So this looks like the thing you stick in your computer, and it is, because that's where you charge this up. This is the power unit. This is the flavor pod, quite small and concise. And you just sort of insert that and smoke through here. Um, the one I'm passing around is creme brulee. You'll find that the flavors are quite authentic. I only brought this one flavor today in this one design. But you could see how in a technology era, especially that our youth are growing up in, they would find this quite cool. Even more importantly, it can stay attached to their computer and be in their backpack, which is at their feet. And they can sort of look for something in their backpack and take a quick hit. And what they know how to do is to make it not appear that they're smoking. Because uh, though there are many videos on the internet that show very cool ways to make smoke rings and designs and what have you, and that's part of the allure. When you're in school, that's not so cool because it got taken away from you pretty quick. So they can actually smoke it without releasing any visible smoke. So the cool aspect of it, the flavors, and then the nicotine addiction part are the three major concerning areas. I'm giving you a list of what I'm going to show you um, about why these things are dangerous and why I'm so concerned about them. I won't read you every item on this slide because there's going to be an individual slide for each one of them. But we're going to go through all the things that um, the adult public should be concerned about. And I think as a state uh, and probably nation, we should all be concerned about as well. So starting with the prevalence of tobacco products and these vaping systems, um, in the past year, when surveyed, one quarter of high school students say that they have used a, a tobacco product. That doesn't necessarily mean this device, but a tobacco product. Um, and indeed, from 2015 to 2017, there was a reduction in use of tobacco products from 25% to 19%. One third of the youth said that uh, they tried to quit, but found these to be highly addictive. We, in our youth risk behavior survey, look at either ever use, meaning they've tried it sometime, versus current use, which is usually looked at as a 20 or 30 day amount of use. So in the most recent youth risk behavior survey in 2017, there was an increase in ever use from 30 to 34 percent, and a decrease in current use from 15 to 12 percent. One of the most important aspects of an addicting substance um, and its uptake in the population is do people consider it to be harmful or safe to use? Um, a lot of people drinking coffee around the table. Most people think caffeine um, is not a big deal, and they don't really look at that as a harmful substance. Um, if there was a injectable opioid like heroin, most people would say, I don't think that's potentially good for me. Um, nicotine has achieved a different kind of sort of notoriety, if you will. So when you look at cigarette use, the combustible cigarettes, our youth are not like having their head in the sand. They know that these are dangerous. They know they could get cancer and lymph disease and heart disease from smoking. So they say, 68% of them say, this is a harmful thing if I was going to start doing this every day. However, when you look at e-cigarettes and look at 12th graders nationally, because we didn't ask this on the last YRBS survey, uh, because this epidemic has happened so quickly that the questions just weren't in place. Um, they say nationally, regular cigarettes, six, 75, 76% uh, harmful. E-cigarettes, 38, 39% harmful. And then looking at a separate independent data source, uh, though reliable, fewer than 50% two years later said uh, they felt it was harmful. 
So there's a certain problem here with people, especially youth, thinking that these substances are not as harmful as traditional cigarettes. And in fact, unfortunately, in our youth risk behavior survey, we also find that when we ask them questions about alcohol and cannabis, they view those as not especially harmful as well. Yeah. Question about that. Um, mm -hmm. So, is originally um, vaping versus juuling was really to help people give up smoking because they could yes. reduce the amount of nicotine yes. over time. And someone in, so my brother did that, my kids saw that, and that we all rejoiced in that as a family because he was finally quitting. Um, and then I caught my youngest. He was having one of these in his backpack. And I asked him about it, and his immediate response was, well, mom, it's not smoking. I'm not hurting my lungs. And I I wasn't sure. You know, so mm -hmm. is it steam or is it smoking? Is it the same sort of, I'm not talking about the nicotine now. I'm just no, talking just about what's the. In the video. I have a separate slide for the alcohol. Oh, OK. Sorry. But um, the short answer is much of it is a great unknown. However, we don't believe the carcinogenic effect is the same. Okay. But we don't absolutely know because it hasn't gone on long enough. Because even getting cancer from <coughs> smoking cigarettes doesn't happen in two, three, five years. It happens in decades. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't actually know. But the perception of harm is usually something that we can correlate with being a good deterrent. And if there's a low perception of harm, that usually correlates with higher uptake. I mentioned earlier the power of flavors. If you did take a whiff of this, I assume you felt it was pretty authentic for creme brulee. Well, it turns out creme brulee and all of the fruity flavors are the ones that the kids are really picking up on the most. And um, I've seen this number, which I have trouble believing. 7,000 flavors. Now, that's not one company producing them all but, you know, with all the competitors. But they don't talk about flavors in terms of tens or hundreds. They talk about them in terms of thousands. So this is pretty dramatic. And um, youth obviously have a high uptake because they appreciate the flavors. The flavor itself is not addicting. It's the fact that the pleasure of the flavor is, is addicting. Yes. Who manufactures these? Well, this is the Jewel Company. So is, it's, is, that, is that a subsidiary of any tobacco company uh, or anything like several that? Several of the uh, companies are part of tobacco companies oh. now because they recognize this is a they great company. They figured yes, yeah. Uh, but not all. Oh, okay. Some of the bigger ones, more recently, I don't know, it's been like the last month, got purchased by uh, large tobacco companies because mm -hmm. they see the trend. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, this, this is kind of a competitor, but it's also part of a portfolio mm -hmm. of uh, addicting nicotine uh, substances. Mm -hmm. uh, the African American population uh, traditionally has favored mint and menthol more so than fruit, and those are also prominent flavor offerings uh, in this group. Um, and this does recapitulate a dark history from cigarettes because the tobacco uh, industry, uh, as everyone kind of says, now that we're talking about marijuana most of the time, that the tobacco industry wrote the playbook about how to get a population addicted to something that gives them pleasure and keep them buying it forever and ever and ever. And usually we talk about sort of the 80-20 formula where you addict 20% of the population and, eight, and that is accounts for 80% of your sales. Everyone else is more casual in this. If we look at the way youth get into smoking these in the first place, 80% uh, of youth say that they appreciated the flavor. That was sort of the thing that they used first that got them going. And there's a very dark history in flavored cigarettes uh, as well, combustible cigarettes, uh, so that this is just following the soup movements. Uh, the physician had on now, nicotine addiction is really uh, a major concern. I think nicotine has uh, not received the uh, notoriety it should receive uh, over time. 
because cigarettes have been around so long and everybody's concerned about lung cancer, not necessarily what is the nicotine doing. And the only time the nicotine comes up is when somebody genuinely wants to quit, and then we try to offer them all kinds of nicotine replacement therapies that might help. Um, but if you look at what nicotine does to a brain, it does a lot in terms of the development of a young brain, uh, the learning potential of that brain, whether it be more long term or whether it be the day that they're in school uh, flooding their brain with nicotine. So it affects their overall learning and attention and can affect behavior because like any addicting substance, you get cranky when you don't have it. Um, and there are stories of how youth even become combative, combative when their devices are taken away. Uh, I just made a uh, presentation to the Recovery Coach Network, which was mostly for opioids, but we brought in the topic to all substances and talked about uh, juuling there. And while I was talking about it, the uh, representative from the Office of the Attorney General was there, who was very appreciative that we were doing this. And within days, he got an email that he sent to me from a parent of a 17-year-old describing a 17-year-old who'd been using these for two years and basically every waking moment was using them. At night was trying to stay awake because he knew the parents would take him away if he wasn't awake. And he was actually becoming uh, abrasive with them because of the fact that if he didn't have this, uh, he couldn't feed his addictions. Very concerning. Um, and we know that the younger the brain, the, the easier the addiction process occurs and the profound nature of the changes in the brain. I don't like to usually scare audiences saying this is the gateway drug, but it actually has been regarded by many in the scientific community as sort of a primer for the brain. So once you got addicted to nicotine, it does prime you in a way that it's easier to get addicted to other substances. When we interview people in the public smoke system who are uh, on treatment for opioid addiction and look at their natural history, they began prescription opioids in their late teens and then perhaps heroin in their early 20s. But pretty uniformly, they began with cigarettes, not these because that was 10 years ago now, but regular cigarettes and nicotine in their early teens, moved on to alcohol and cannabis in their mid-teens, and then to the opioids. Um, the other impressive fact is that if you talk to adults who are uh, constant smokers, 95% of them say they began before age 21. So again, that impact on the youth brain is so important to aid in the way. And we talk about the developing brain from teenage years all the way to 25, because the young adult brain actually is still developing through age 25. And the pregnant and uh, recently delivered population were also really of concern to us because obviously of the impacts on the fetus while they're pregnant and on the new child uh, being in the environment for some of the smoking and they're developing. Not only do you think these are not harmful, but impressively they don't understand that there's nicotine in them sometimes. So again, they're being attracted to the coolness of the technology and the flavor, uh, they may or may not know there's nicotine. But up to 40% of them in survey say they didn't know there was nicotine. And I didn't tell you this when I did my little demo. So this has about 200 hits that you can get out of it, this flavor part. That's um, equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. So. If you think about how quickly you can do 200 hits of these, that will probably, kids do share these, and they're not going to do this all in one sitting. But over time, they can probably do that a lot quicker than a pack of cigarettes. And so the potency of the nicotine in here is very high. Again, sort of akin to the THC of today versus the THC of people who were in college in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, it's very, very different. So nicotine being such an addicting substance, it's now at a level that can predict addiction even more. We've had people present at our health department who, uh, I'll just say this one thing, at the health department 
uh, we had a sort of international uh, summit um, on, on these devices. And we had two high school kids there who uh, were very, very uh, powerful in their testimony to everybody in the room. But a constant story is people who graduate high school and are going to either to a job or to college and are still using these and say, if I had only known this was addicting, I might not have done this because I can't get off of that. And we're finding in the uh, clinical world that you can't get off of these as easily with things we use for smoking cessation uh, compared to regular cigarettes. I just, uh, from an economic standpoint, what does one of those little pods compare to a pack of cigarettes? Yes, so um, I believe it's two pack of cigarettes to one pod in terms of price differential. So they're cheaper too. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot out of this. Yeah. That's why I was comparing it. You said it's equivalent yes. to like a pack of cigarettes. So, so, so the nicotine is equivalent, but the price is actually even better. Cheaper, and, right? Cheaper. And I think you can get one of these for $25 to $35. Um, mm -hmm. The part that you don't have to change. Right. Um, so, and kids, you know, pool resources. So before that, they buy one of these yeah. and share. Um, excuse can me. you change? Can, can you can you keep the base and just yes. add the yeah. little yeah. thing? Just keep putting whatever flavor you want in it. You can use it for CBD oil. That's coming so up on the slide so too. You can put yes. So you could be very uh, innovative, to say the least. So these harms about that we don't know so well, clearly there's a vapor, so this could affect your airways. People talk about volatile organic compounds in the way that we talk about, you know, PFAS and water, uh, that being a volatile organic compound in a sense as well. Uh, and we don't know so much about what are all the organic compounds that are coming into your circulation through your lungs. We don't know the impact of what's in all of the flavors. Because you're not just so sort of chewing gum, you're actually inhaling this and it's getting into the bloodstream. Uh, studies have shown that there are contaminants, but we don't know what the contaminants might do. There are metallic fragments. We don't know what they do when they get into the deeper part of your lung. Um, and in, in addition to these volatile organic compounds, people use the word ultrafine particles because obviously it's dissolved in the liquid and so they're very fine particles, but there's a history through modern medicine of lots of ultra-fine particles that aren't good for people's lungs, like silica uh, in people's minds and things like that. So, so we don't know enough about lung health yet because it hasn't been going on long enough. Potential downstream impacts might have to do with the fact that there's now clear documentation that even though you may have started using these because you didn't want to smoke cigarettes, people end up going to the smoking cigarette route uh, through this pathway. Um, and then, of course, they have all the risks of regular cigarettes, like lung cancer and heart disease and everything else. And this most recent literature, and this is now literally within the last month, has to do with what are we going to do with the generation of people who are now adults who are actually addicted to these because we really don't know, as I alluded to before, just treating them for this addiction uh, isn't the same as treating somebody who's just a combustible cigarette smoker. A lot of the therapies have not been shown to work uh, in this particular realm. How do you get these? Kind of the same way they get regular cigarettes. It's exactly the same. And unfortunately, again, I hate to be the uh, so the alarm raiser here, the same way they get prescription opioids. Uh, it's through the diversion route, whether they beg, borrowed, stealed, uh, were given uh, these by, by a youth who was of age to purchase them. Uh, if somehow they got them. Um, and it's usually through a peer network. However, they can be very creative on the internet as well. One thing that FDA Commissioner Gottlieb was quite uh, aghast to learn when he was researching this was that the age verification uh, software or whatever we call it on the internet is not foolproof. And you know how to get around that. And in some cases, it was 
people have demonstrated you just click that you're over 18, and that's acceptable. It didn't actually ask you for any other way to verify that that was truly your age. So whether you're buying it from a retailer or diverting it or getting it through the internet, it's not a real hard task to get. I don't want to call out in a negative way retailers in Vermont, because actually we found that they are really, really cooperative and helpful, whether it be alcohol, regular cigarettes, or these. Uh, but certainly legislation that proposed making it even more restrictive to buy these would obviously be useful. But I don't want you to think that the Vermont retail community is responsible for this epidemic. I think they really come in in a nice way uh, doing the job they're supposed to do as part of the liquor control and tobacco control legislation. And then, as was just stated a few minutes ago, co addiction. So you can put whatever you want on these pods. And, you know, CBD oil, that, I, I love that actually because that implies there's no THC in it. But there's also fluids that will have THC. And in states that have legalized marijuana and has a, have an active tax and regulate system, they can actually um, vape marijuana. Uh, they don't have to smoke it. You know, there are plenty of routes you can get it in through. Uh, and the um, playbook of the tobacco industry would actually imply that it would be a good thing for industry to have liquids that would co addict people. So not only are they getting addicted to nicotine, but addicted to THC at the same time. Um, and I told you about the 80 20 rule. We talked about the price point. Uh, oh, two pods is one pack. Yeah, so one pod. So either way you look at it, it's cheap. Yeah. <laughs> We're not the math committee. Right. <laughs> and then there's the lack of regulatory framework. So I told you about the internet uh, age verification loopholes, um, and the fact that online purchases really are not restricted. Um, there's no real regulatory framework that's built around what these flavors are, what's in these pods, uh, testing the products for safety. We did a lot of good work, and youth actually helped us with our counterbalance campaign to get rid of flavors in cigarettes, but it's now the same problem in these. And the marketing strategies for the companies have not been limited, uh, though they've been called out in the public uh, press by the FDA and others now. The FDA, unfortunately, has come up with a bunch of things they thought would be useful, but none of them have really happened, and they all take time. Um, and I would think states could probably accomplish them a lot quicker than the FDA will. But we're really, really gratified to see that surge in interest in the fact that they're going to uh, do something at some point in time um, to make it less easy to access these if you're a youth. And my last slide is just this graph that shows uh, the incredible improvement we've seen over time, both in adult and youth rates of uh, use of tobacco products in Vermont. And as one of my early slides showed you, unfortunately, even though the youth rate, uh, 217 is not on here, but it's down to 9%, uh, the youth rate of use of these is 12%. So we hate to see a lines that are starting to go in the wrong direction crisscrossing, because um, we have made so much progress uh, with our population. Plenty of progress left to make, but uh, still. And it's especially concerning if these do lead some element of youth to pick up regular cigarettes, because uh, that will impact that graph as well. So those are the sort of prepared things I have to say. I'm more than willing to answer any questions or talk about something you maybe wanted me to talk about that I didn't mention. I'm just curious, um, in terms of other states, are there other states that um, we can look to that are forward thinking in terms of how to deal with you know, this crisis? Yeah, so my sense is um, this is so uh, fast in coming, and so recent, that I can't tell you a lot about what other states have done. Mm -hmm. you know, often we have models, but uh, mm -hmm. I think we would be an early adopter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Fusion of innovation curve, uh, or at least uh, an innovator, even maybe. Uh, it's not like this is picked up much anywhere else. Right. One thing that's good in Vermont 
um, and I don't want to preempt the next presentation, but um, there's already a lot of good things we did with regular old combustible cigarettes, but wrote the legislation in a way that would apply to any of these uh, nicotine delivery system products. So we're ahead of the game in, in that regard in terms of the social aspects where you can smoke. I appreciate that question, and we can ask the Ledge Council mm -hmm. to um, explore that. And <clears throat> I won't be here tomorrow because I'm going um, out of state to a national council and state legislatures meeting around. It happens to be around maternal child health, but the, mm -hmm. those sort of that that group of people who were there. So I can ask mm -hmm. inquire them Great. as well. Great. Um, Topper, did you have your hand up? So did I see a hand over? Yeah, it was more that um, um, Mary Beth asked the question I was going to ask. I'm sorry, quick thing. I mean, it's not quick, but if you had your wish, what what would be the four or five, you know, four things that would be top on your list that you think we should do, we could do to slow this down? Yeah. Uh, um, is that In your role as a, um, yes. um, I, I want to remind members of the committee that the Commissioner of Health works for the governor, mm -hmm. so um, we have to if we we have to make sure that we give him the opportunity to respond from what does science or yes. what does literature or what does past practice as opposed to what would he like to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another version of this graph that is very messy to look at because it looks at the Vermont uh, preventive health framework and looks at interventions you can do in a problem like smoking from the individual level, through the family level, through the community level, through the organizational level, all the way to the policy level. And if you look at these major drops off, drop offs and rates, many of them, if not most, were accompanied by legislation that either impacted how easy is it to smoke in our society or how expensive is it to smoke in our society. So those kinds of uh, interventions from a public policy standpoint had the biggest bang for the buck. If I just sat with you as my patient in the exam room and said, Smoking is not a good idea. You've increased your risk of heart disease and lung cancer. That gives uh, a 1% payoff. So <coughs> one out of 100 people might actually quit because I said that. Now over time, maybe more than one would, but that could take decades to finally get to that point. Whereas if I dropped the price, I mean increased the price tremendously or impeded your ability in society to smoke readily, uh, that would have a very much more immediate and sustained effect. Um, so those kind of interventions were very, very powerful. Um, and it turns out that though I did allude to the fact we did a lot of good in our laws previously, um, you can actually, as we just talked, buy these cheaper than regular cigarettes. And they're not subject to some of the same uh, penalties financially that regular cigarettes are subject to. So that's a proven public health intervention. Uh, another public health intervention that I, I can't say is as proven, though the CDC does support it very much, is um, raising the age of smoking to 21. So it turns out that 18-year-olds um, have peer groups, certainly 15, 16, 17 year olds have peer groups, but they all have something in common. They're all in the same school together. Uh, and those who are now eligible to buy these are eligible to divert them, just like regular cigarettes. And that's the way kids have started smoking forever, is it's accessible to them. And states that have raised the age to 21, um, the thought is that there's no peer group anymore that's eligible to buy. Um, because the 19 and 20 and 21 year olds are not like in the high school or middle school environment anymore. So it's less easy to have that diversion occur. I will say that only six states thus far have gotten into that 21 law. 
over 300 cities have. Many of them uh, feel successful. One of the most major cities in America, though, uh, has actually reported no success, and that was New York City. Um, the thought about New York City was that it was not the law that was the problem, it was the enforcement of the law that was the problem. Um, so that's all I can say. Uh, the CDC uh, estimates that uh, environments that do raise the age have a 10 to 12 percent decrease in the uptake of smoking and living um, as a result of that. Um, so, so those are sort of public health interventions that at least we know something about in the literature uh, that would be helpful. The other thing that the FDA is thinking about doing, which uh, I would certainly endorse, is banning the sale of fruity flavored cigarettes uh, or e-cigarettes. Uh, and that certainly would eliminate one of the major attractants for middle and high school students, those flavors. In a less, in a more controversial way, they did actually extend that to mint and menthol, which from a public health person's standpoint, reeks of lack of health equity, because that doesn't give the African American population the same opportunity to be as healthy by not using these, because they can still use the flavors of choice for, uh, for them, uh, as history has shown. And the other thing that the commissioner recommended, uh, the FDA commissioner, was actually uh, restricting where you could buy these. Uh, so you couldn't go into just like your gas station uh, convenience store. Uh, it wouldn't be good enough to have them in a special place there. But if you went to a special vaping store that had a very restricted area and did all the age verification, et cetera, et cetera, they felt that maybe that would be a, a good public health intervention as well. So those are the kinds of things that we know about that could have potential to work. Okay, we have time for one more question. <coughs> Do you know how long a charge, how, how long one of those? Oh, how long the charge last? Well, um, the, the, the base itself. Um, so they don't have to keep buying the base, all they have to do is no, buy Oh, them. yeah, right. So like they must spend $30 and then like, two months later, you know, my sense is this is like your memory stick. It keeps charging. It's the gift that keeps giving. You know, you never need to replace it for that reason. I mean, it probably does have a finite life span, but I don't think it's short. It's quite long. But, you know, the incentive to buy a new charge would be a new design. Because again, this is to be attractive to youth, even though the company says we never market it to youth. Uh, so there's many ways you can blitz it up that people would want the latest version. Currently, because <clears throat> because it contains nicotine, it's uh, it's illegal to buy it less than if you're less than 18. Yes, is that correct. correct. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a prohibition on it, but it's easy to have other people buy it for you, just like. Exactly. And as I said on the internet, it seems like you can be 15 and buy it. Yeah. Uh, and Why well, not? I had two sons, who, I had two youngest sons, wanted to stop smoking. Both of us did try it, but they didn't stay with the, the baby. And one of them just, you know, I guess I was discussing the money with them and why he was always out of money. <laughs> <laughs> He just quit smoking cold turkey. Sure. One day he just stopped, and you know his brother can't believe it because he can't stop. But, you know, but the, uh, I, I wish I knew the secret of what made him able to just just one day he just said he wasn't going to spend seventy dollars a week on smoking anymore. You know? I, mean, that's what I should say two quick things in response. One is that these have been advocated to be ways to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the literature actually has not come out definitive on that. It's actually come out divergent, where there's an equal amount for and equal amount against. So people are not yet 100% convinced this will help you get off of regular cigarettes. And the second thing is that, uh, just to bring me back to the beginning of my presentation, if you go to talk to any superintendent, principal, or teacher, you will see the absolute you know, torment that you're going through. And if you ask the principal to open their top desk drawer, you will see 
so many of these and other related devices, it would just blow your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really a, it, it's at the crisis level of the schools, which is why the schools are inviting me, because uh, they, the students, they had their own little session for, but the parents and the community members are just like, oh my God, what have we created here? You know, it's a real monster. So Vermonters, I think, would be appreciative of us all paying attention to this. Absolutely, and thank you. Thank you very much. I think you've given us a great sure. um, introduction and overview of the health um, aspects in terms of setting stages or whatever, informing us. Um, now we have legislative oh, council. Legislative council, are you bringing a friend with you? I am not, but I've asked her to listen. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, while, while, while you are getting in your seat, um, we have all sorts of new people in this room, and this is still the beginning of the session. So I, um, if people who are sitting around could please identify themselves and who their client is. Hi, I'm Sherry Les Bronson I'm with William Jewelers and Associates. And who is your client? The mm -hmm. Vermont Association of Chain and Drug Stores. Hi, Matt McMahon with MMR, and our firm represents Reynolds, which makes a vapor. Nice. Maggie Lundsman-Lee and I, and we represent the Vape Technology Association. The what? The Vape Technology okay. Association. Jill Sunhoff garen Vermont Medical Society. Hi, Rebecca Ryan with the American Lung Association. Jennifer Katza with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. And are you Orca? <laughs> Hello, I'm Shale Livingston, I'm a policy advisor for the Health Department. Um, I'm Kate Grass. I'm the executive assistant to the Commissioner of Taxes. Um, I'm Kate, and my mom is Jill. Kate, Jill, we'll grade her after. I'm Anthea Dexter Cooper, and I'm a new coworker of Jen's, and I'm just observing her in her element for a little bit. Uh, welcome to Legislative Council. Mm -hmm. What committee are you? Transportation. Mostly. Okay. Okay. Got a fancy presentation. Right, but you know, there's some new new toys and PowerPoints. I see. <laughs> 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 pretty much the best one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm Jennifer Carvey. I'm the Chief Legislative Counsel. Um, I'm the Chief Legislative Counsel. 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 So the first thing I wanted to show you is where find our smoking laws. They're actually spread out in a couple of different places in our statutes that can make them hard to find. So one of them is in Title Seven in Chapter 40. Title Seven is largely on alcoholic beverages, but there is a chapter on tobacco products. Um, so that's where a lot of the stuff about who can buy and who can sell lives. And then in Title 18, there are two different chapters that both uh, have some elements of smoking laws in them. One of them is Chapter 28 on occupational health. This has some uh, subchapter on smoking in the workplace. And then the other is Chapter 37, which is smoking in public places. Um, some of these work fairly well together in some places. It's a little confusing how to read them together. Um, so we may make some efforts to clean that up if we're making some other changes. So first I wanted to give you some, here's some definitions um, from Title VII and they do get used in other places in the statutes as well. Um, so the first is tobacco products. That's a term that's used a lot in the statutes and that's a lot of uh, what you might traditionally think of as, to, as tobacco products. We've got cigarettes, little cigars, roll your own tobacco, snuff, cigars, new smokeless tobacco, and any other product that's manufactured from, derived from, or contains tobacco that is intended for human consumption by smoking, chewing, or in any other manner. So can I ask a question? So does that mean the material that goes into the jewel or um, the electronic cigarettes are not considered a do they fit into this? Right, no, this definition is really your kind of more traditional tobacco containing products. So we'll look in two more slides at um, what would be, what would constitute 
the electronic cigarettes and the flavor pods or nicotine pods that go into them. But no, this, and this is why in some places, and, and this will come up when we look at the legislation today, we need to refer to things beyond just tobacco products to cover the whole landscape. So we have tobacco products, and we have tobacco paraphernalia. And this is any device used, intended for use, or designed for use in smoking, inhaling, ingesting, or otherwise introducing tobacco products into the human body or for preparing tobacco for smoking, inhaling, ingesting, or otherwise introducing into the human body. This specifies that it includes devices for holding tobacco, rolling paper, wraps, cigarette rolling machines, pipes, water pipes, carburation devices and bongs, and hookahs. So we're still not quite into your e-cigarettes yet. That's going to be on the next slide. I've never heard of a hookah. Oh, oh, really? I almost yeah. gave you a picture on here of one, because they can find that sometimes, but Google it. <laughs> and then uh, our third definition, and this is where we get into the e-cigarettes, is tobacco substitute. And this is a term uh, that was developed, if not in this committee, at least in part in this committee, um, a number of years ago. This describes products, and it specifically says including electronic cigarettes or other electronic or battery powered devices that contain and are designed to deliver nicotine or other substances into the body through the inhalation of vapor and that have not been approved by the US Food and Drug Administration for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes. So if it's something that's FDA approved, uh, for, for tobacco cessation, that's not a tobacco substitute under here. We're talking about things like what Dr. Levine was showing you, that's a device that is designed to be used to inhale nicotine uh, vapor into the body. Products that have been specified, um, products that have been approved by the, the FDA for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes are not tobacco substitutes, not what we're talking about here. So these are our three categories then, and you'll see them come up a lot. We've got tobacco products, we've got tobacco paraphernalia, and we've got tobacco substitutes. Those make sense so far? All right, great. And let's see how those come up. So we have some existing restrictions on the sale of tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, and paraphernalia. There is a prohibition on selling or providing tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, or tobacco paraphernalia to anyone under 18 years of age. There are also existing prohibitions on vending machines that sell tobacco products. So if you remember those old cigarette machines, those are banned and have been for a while. Um, there is a provision that says tobacco products and substitutes can only be displayed or stored, and there are some exceptions, but the general rule is behind a sales counter or in a, another area inaccessible to the public. So it could be behind the counter, it could be in the back room, or in a locked container. Somebody has to ask for these. They can't just reach out and grab one at the register. And that was something that this committee worked on a few years ago. There's also a prohibition on the sale or purchase of BDs. I had to look that one up. Um, so you can see a very small print for me down at the bottom. Uh, BDs are small, thin, hand-rolled cigarettes imported to the U.S. primarily from India and other Southeast Asian countries. The statutes define them as a product containing tobacco that's wrapped in some leaves I'm not going to try to pronounce. Um, but these are very specific products, and those are just not allowed. You can't buy them, you can't purchase them in Vermont. And that prohibition has also been in place for a number of years. And there's a prohibition on selling cigarettes or little cigars individually or in packs of fewer than 20. Then we have possession or purchase by a minor. So a person who's under 18 years of age shall not possess, can't have, purchase, or attempt to purchase tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, or tobacco paraphernalia. In addition, a person under 18 shall not misrepresent their age to purchase or attempt to purchase these products for items. A person who is under 18 years of age who possesses these items is subject to having them immediately confiscated and a, being uh, subject to a $25 civil penalty. And if the person mis misrepresents their age by presenting false identification to purchase these items, they will be fined up to $50 or uh, required to provide up to 10 hours of community service or both. 
So you can't have them if you're under 18. You can't buy. You can't have them. You can't buy them, and you can't try to buy them. Okay. So the next slide. Okay. So that's regulating the behavior of the under 18 year olds themselves. It is also uh, impermissible to sell or furnish tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, or tobacco paraphernalia to a person who's under 18 years of age. If somebody does, they are subject to a civil penalty of not more than $100 for a first offense, not more than $500 for any subsequent offense. The law also requires the Division of Liquor Control to conduct or contract out for compliance tests of tobacco licensees where they send in 16 and 17 year olds to try to purchase tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, and tobacco paraphernalia. Uh, and the goal is to maintain at least 90% statewide compliance for buyers who are 16 or 17 years old. And there's a report on this that comes up periodically that I think goes to the House General Committee, not this committee. Um, but we may have changed that. Um, and multiple violations, if, if somebody keeps selling to minors, um, then they can have a, their tobacco license suspended for short periods of time, and there's different periods. Um, there's different periods depending on uh, how many violations there were, and uh, it can be for a couple of weekdays or for weekend days if they're frequent violators. So that includes gifting. Yes. I'm going back to the. Um, yes. So for, furnishing is a pretty wide definition. You can't sell it, but you also can't give it, provide it to them, or in any other way. Uh, this this may be a question as much for James as for you. Um, if, if one sells, one doesn't have to be 21 to sell alcohol, right? And you don't have to be 18 to sell cigarettes. You can be. I believe it was. It is 16 in our statutes. Um, and there is, yeah, I didn't put that language in. Okay, no, this is just Topper. Uh, <clears throat> what, what happens if uh, I, I violate one of these rules and um, I get a $25 fine or a $100 fine? Um, what happens if I say I'm not going <clears> to <throat> pay? They're enforceable through the Judicial Bureau, so the Judicial Branch handles the collection of those. I don't think I'm familiar enough with the actual processes there. Um, to understand, uh, I can certainly find out for you what the Judicial Bureau process is. But that's how it's enforced. It's enforced like a traffic ticket. I suppose you know that, Anthony. Oh, nothing. <laughs> 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 okay. This may be a silly question, but it's tobacco. Is, can no you, such thing tobacco and question. nicotine can be the same? In other words, could you put nicotine here and it would all stay the same? Are they the same? Nicotine is is included in cigarettes, and I may turn to the commissioner on some of this. So the nicotine is the part that is um, consistent throughout cigarettes and electronic cigarettes. It's the tobacco that is present in the combustible cigarettes that is not in the electronic cigarettes. Okay, so all of this that just says tobacco is not. So when it says tobacco yes. products, we're, t we're talking about, uh, you know, like uh, the stuff yeah. that people dip. Um, that's you the pipe, you, okay. Right, stuff that goes in a pipe, you chew. regular cigarettes, yeah, the chew. Um, all of that fits into the tobacco products category because there's tobacco involved, um, but the nicotine is, is a consistent element. I think there are, or there may be some uh, things that people can I, I recall testimony in this committee in the past from vaping advocates that there are some non nicotine flavor pods. Um, but that does not seem to be the majority of them. Okay. So in other words, so if we just refer to something as containing nicotine, you may be leaving open uh, a window that you don't intend to. We have an existing statute on internet sales that says, and we'll be revisiting this one in a few minutes, um, it, that says it is illegal to cause Cigarettes, roll your own tobacco, little cigars, or snuff. Um, so we're talking now just in the world of tobacco products. Uh, ordered or purchased by mail or through a computer network, telephonic network, or other electronic network to be shipped to anyone in Vermont other than a licensed wholesale dealer or retail dealer. So uh, 
if, so the only people who should be able to order online and have these things sent to them are uh, dealers, licensed wholesale dealers or retail dealers. It is also illegal to provide substantial assistance to someone in violating this uh, mm -hmm. prohibition. So and I think that is so that you know if somebody's using the library's computer to order something, the library was not knowingly involved in providing assistance to someone in violating this provision, but if somebody is <coughs> helping out, helping another person out um, to order something, Sorry. then they would be violating this provision. Chapter um, and then Teresa. How is that one? Uh, statute does not specify. Uh, there is, so it, it allows the, I, I just shouldn't say that. I think the Attorney General's office is who um, enforces it. I don't know the extent of their enforcement, uh, but there are criminal penalties and there are also civil penalties available from the Attorney General's office. Tapper, is your question on um, internet sale or yeah. all sale? Well, I, the, the, I know when the stores how they do it. Okay, so, okay. I'm just trying to figure the out internet. what the internet. Right. The okay. internet piece refers to uh, the Attorney General's office as opposed to with the controller, I guess it's now the Department of Liquor and Lottery. Yeah. Um, they have people who go on there. Right. They're the, involved in the compliance checks. Um, but internet sales um, is uh, through law enforcement and the Attorney General's office. So my question was um, that definition does not include mm -hmm. the faking. No, but in about five minutes, you're going to hear from somebody who is proposing that it should. Gotcha. Yeah, that's the that's H26 that we're about to look at, and that's why I thought it would be helpful for you to see that our current law just refers to um, the tobacco products. The bill we're going to look at would add in the tobacco paraphernalia and the tobacco substitutes, which is that term we use for electronic cigarettes. Can you my thought process on the organization of today's testimony was um, one, why do we care? Um, so the public health kinds of things. And two, what's the current landscape in the policy world? Um, and so do we need to do anything? I mean, that then becomes a policy decision. And what is the proposal? So the Representative Till, when we finish this, will be sharing what the proposal is. Right, so violations of this provision are punishable as follows. Uh, a knowing or intentional violation results in imprisonment for up to five years, a fine of up to $5,000 or both. The Attorney General can also impose a civil penalty, so we have a criminal penalty and then also a civil penalty of up to $5,000 for each violation. A violation is also considered an unfair and deceptive trade practice in violation of Vermont's Consumer Protection Act, which gives um, the Attorney General's office a lot more tools at their disposal to investigate and enforce. I'm just curious why we let these other things out, like tobacco substitutes and all the And tobacco paraphernalia? Yeah. Um, I've looked to those who've been on the committee. Yeah. It just it wasn't an, was an issue case. back then. Perhaps it wasn't. I don't think this section has been amended in quite a while. Uh, so it may have predated the emergence of, of these problems. <clears throat> All right. So that was the type, those were the Title VII provisions relating to uh, kind of the products themselves. And then we get into the sections on using these. <clears throat> combustible tobacco products and new cigarettes and electronic cigarettes. So our first group of statutes relate to smoking in the workplace. Smoking cigarettes and using electronic cigarettes, it, it uses the terms that we use in the statute that the uh, lighted tobacco products, so a lighted cigarette um, and uh, using a uh, tobacco substitute, which is the electronic cigarette. I thought it might be easier just to put it this way. So smoking cigarettes and using e-cigarettes is prohibited in any workplace. And it gives uh, a lot of information about what a workplace looks like. Workplace means an enclosed structure where employees perform services for an employer. That includes restaurants, bars, and other establishments that serve food or drinks or both. Except for schools, it says workplace does not include areas commonly open to the public 
or any part of a structure that also serves as an employee's or employer's personal residence. Still working on, on understanding exactly what was intended. I've been talking to the health department about this as I was putting this together. I thought, I don't know what that means. It does not include areas commonly open to the public. We do have another set of laws that we're going to look at next on smoking in public places, but I think it might make sense at some point to give a little clarity around how these all work together. Um, for schools, workplace includes any enclosed location where instruction or other school-sponsored functions occur. And for resorts, hotels, and motels, the workplace includes hotel rooms and suites. You may remember over the last few years, um, all hotel rooms in Vermont are now smoke-free. That did not used to be the case. There used to be no smoking in the common areas, but you could smoke in rooms that had been designated for smoking. Now there's no smoking in any hotel rooms. <coughs> There are a couple of exceptions to the ban on smoking in the workplace. Uh, so there was an exception carved out for um, what are commonly referred to as vaping lounges, places that are, are established for the purpose of selling um, electronic cigarettes and flavor pods to customers and then allowing them a place to use those. So somebody working in a vaping lounge doesn't get to say, you can't smoke in my workplace, because that's the purpose of that workplace. Um, there's also an exception for the designated indoor smoking area at the Vermont Veterans Home. There is one place inside there where people are allowed to smoke and that has continued to be exempted from these restrictions. Enforcement of the smoking in the workplace uh, provisions is by employee complaint to the Department of Health. And there is a prohibition on employers um, retaliating, taking adverse action against an employee uh, for enforcing the ban. And there is a provision specifying that this law does not restrict municipal smoking ordinances that might go further. Um, they have to be at least as protective of the rights of non-smokers as the state law, but municipalities can, in, can impose additional restrictions on top of these. So that's the smoking in the workplace piece. And then we have smoking in public places. And this provision says that smoking cigarettes and using electronic cigarettes is prohibited in all enclosed indoor places of publicly access, public access and publicly owned buildings and offices. It defines a place of public access as any place of business, commerce, banking, financial service, or other service related activity, whether publicly or privately owned and whether it is for profit or nonprofit to which the general public has access or which the general public uses. And it gives some examples that are included, buildings and offices, means of transportation and common carrier waiting rooms, arcades, restaurants, bars, and cabarets, retail stores and grocery stores, libraries, theaters, concert halls, auditoriums, and arenas, barber shops, hair salons, laundromats, and shopping malls, museums, art galleries, sports and fitness facilities, planetariums, and historical sites, common areas of nursing homes and hospitals, common areas meaning where uh, people that are open to the public, including lobbies, hallways, elevators, restaurants, restrooms, and cafeterias, and buildings or facilities, facilities owned or operated by a social, fraternal, or religious club. And, um, Jen, if I recall, when we use include, it's yes. not limited by? That's a great question. Yes. So uh, in fact, in, we specify in statute in Title I that including means including but not limited to. But we don't have to say but not limited to every time. It saves us some space in the green books. Uh, but it is always a non-exhaustive list. So these are some examples, but it is not the, the full landscape. Um, we have different ways of saying. Um, something that is supposed to be exhaustive, like shall mean the following, or something like that, um, that includes is illustrative but not exhaustive. All right, smoking, other additional uh, provisions on smoking in public places. Smoking cigarettes and using e-cigarettes is also prohibited in all enclosed indoor places in lodging establishments, such as resorts, hotels, and motels, including sleeping quarters and adjoining rooms rented to guests. So again, a workplace where you can't smoke includes hotel rooms. And this prohibition on smoking in public places also includes hotel rooms. So under both of these chapters, you can't smoke in a hotel. So, so are e-cigarettes the same thing 
that we were just talking about. Yes, I mean, it, yes, that, so e-cigarettes is, is how I'm describing the tobacco substitutes that we define it. Tobacco substitute is actually the term that's used, but yes, that includes. Um, that very attractive. The, yes, the device you were shown by the commission. Smoking cigarettes and using e-cigarettes is also prohibited in designated smoke-free areas of property or grounds owned by or leased to the state or to a municipality. It's prohibited in any other area within 25 feet of state-owned buildings and offices. And I took a picture, as you can see it on the right, from downstairs outside um, <laughs> the side door to the state house. That's why that sign says, no smoking within 25 feet of this building. Um, and it's prohibited on the grounds of any Who hospital. Who monitors that? I'm sorry? Who monitors that? Uh, Sergeant at Arms. Yeah, Sergeant at Arms, Capitol Police, I think, are the ones who are responsible for that. And if we see something, say something. Yes. yes. The cigarette butts right on the bottom of the door. Yes, people often do still stand right outside. Somebody who works next door and goes back and forth. We have a new member. And smoking cigarettes and using e-cigarettes is also prohibited on the grounds of any hospital or secure residential recovery facility owned or operated by the state, uh, including all enclosed places in the hospital or facility and the surrounding outdoor property. So if you drive by the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital in Berlin, you will see people out on the sidewalk off mm -hmm. the property smoking and back as well. There are exceptions to the ban on smoking in public places that are, um, two of them are the same as what you saw in the smoking in the workplace provision. So there's an exception for vaping lounges and for the designated indoor smoking area at the Vermont Veterans <coughs> Home. There is also an exception for areas not commonly open to the public of an owner operated business with no employees. So the sole proprietorship and there's a part of the, plate of the um, store or office that is not commonly open to the public, that owner can smoke in that area. As long as that owner has no employees. As long as they have no employees, right? This is sole proprietorship, no employees. And finally, the enforcement provisions um, for the smoking in public places laws, the proprietor, a proprietor or employee who sees someone smoking or using an, an electronic cigarette must ask the person to stop. It's a shall in our statute. Shall ask the person to stop. If the person persists, the proprietor would ask the person to leave the premises. Uh, and again, we have this provision saying that the state law does not restrict municipal smoking ordinances that go further than this in protecting the rights of non-smokers. So uh, an, an example of that might be uh, in a community that had a public park that's an open space, but they decide to have an ordinance that there's no smoking in that park. Right. That be? Yep. Yeah, they can define they can other that. spaces as smoke free as long as they are going building on this and not um, not giving more smoking access. Oh. Just uh, based on what you said about all these places you can't smoke or use uh, uh, tobacco substitutes, mm -hmm. these are all the children that Dr. Levine was talking about that are doing this in school or breaking the law. Mm -hmm. right? okay. And would be subject to fine. Well, they would be. They could be subject under the the prohibition on possessing mm -hmm. the products. But well, I mean, he's saying that they're they're, they're actually vaping. Oh no, I, uh, I understand. So there is no monetary yeah. penalty associated with these prohibitions. Okay. So, um, so you're right that they are not allowed to uh, smoke. In, in, I mean, a school is also yeah. the teacher's workplace, right. um, so they are not allowed to smoke in any enclosed location where instruction or other school-sponsored functions occur, um, but the enforcement is by employee complaint to the Department of Health. Thank you. Um, it doesn't seem like that addresses tobacco use in general. This so all does, if it just says smoking cigarettes. It no, it, said, it, it uses the official language. I was trying to make it more accessible, but it does say possession of lighted tobacco products and use of tobacco substitutes is prohibited in these places. But does that also include dip and other means of ingesting no. tobacco or products? No, it's re it refers to lighted tobacco products. That's a big question. In a daycare center where there is an Oh yeah, we do have, I didn't need to put those on there. We 
have we do have provisions in our statutes on um, smoking in or not smoking in child care facilities um, and licensed child care homes. They're slightly different depending on whether it's a center where there's no smoking on the premises um, or whether it's a licensed home where there's no smoking um, when there are children present. Yeah, and I read this last thing. I'm not commonly open to the public, so a person's house, other than where the children are, would not be open to the public. But the added thing here of an owner-operated business with no employees, what if there is an employee? Can they smoke in that house? So the, I would consider, uh, so I, smoking in a child care facility, I don't think falls necessarily under the smoking in public places provision. It would fall under the specific provision on smoking in a child care facility. Um, so whether it, it may be an area that's open or maybe a, a public place if it's a child care center, um, but a person's home is not a public place. So, uh, but once you're talking about a child care, whether it's a child care facility or a licensed child care home, we do have a specific prohibition on smoking in those. Yeah, I, I, that I, I might know. fall under smoking in the workplace. It, it could to the, I mean, I think the clearest one is the, the one that applies directly to that. Yeah. And I did not think to put that in here. There's a special provision just for child care. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and Jen will pull that up. Yes. Yeah. So, pull it up. My, my point is, I know about all of that, yeah. but the way this is written, it says if you have an employee in an area not commonly <laughs> open to the public, in an owner-operated business, the daycare center is an owner-operated business, if they have an employee, even though I know about the specific thing of daycare centers, do they fall under this? This is what this is an exception. So an exception to the ban on smoking in public places is for an, there is an exception for an owner-operated business with no employees that has areas that are not commonly open to the public as right. part of. It. Uh, um, I, I think before we continue the back and forth, it is best if you pull up the specific around uh, uh, there. Yeah, I can't find it. Sorry. Um, and as people are talking about laws related to tobacco that perhaps are not here, I think we have something around um, smoking in cars with um, babies. With, oh, oh. With babies. Yeah, I went to the obvious ones, but I'm sorry. I didn't and um, I, I, yeah, I forget the age, but. Uh, needing a job. Needing a job. Okay, so needing a job. So that's. Yeah, yeah, so you cannot smoke in a car with a child present who is uh, under the age of eight, which is the age at which you need to be in a, under federal law, in a um, child, in a car seat or booster seat. Um, okay, thank you. And now we have, yes, um, well, while question. you are pulling that up, is, um, perhaps we should wait for the other questions. Yeah. Um, I think there were some provisions added to this last year when the legislature were talking. Okay, um, we have too much talking. Thank you. I think this was, some of this was revisited last year uh, to add marijuana when the legislature was working on provisions relating to uh, marijuana, but there is language in Title 33 that says no person shall be permitted to use marijuana uh, or cultivate it or use tobacco products or tobacco substitutes on the premises both indoor and outdoor of any licensed child care center or after school program at any time. So that's the center. Can't use them on the premises at any time. And then no person is permitted to use marijuana, tobacco products, or tobacco substitutes on the premises, both indoors and in any outdoor area designated for child care of a licensed or registered family child care home while children are present and in care. Um, and if use of marijuana or smoking of tobacco products or tobacco substitutes 
occurs on the premises during other times, the family child care home must notify prospective families before they enroll their child in that family child care home that the child will be exposed to an environment in which marijuana, tobacco products, or tobacco substitutes are used. You can't grow marijuana. And we are keeping this discussion on tobacco. Um, so, Topper, continuing with your question around child care centers. I don't know how, the, I, I, I thought I said, does this apply to a daycare center? Uh, I don't see why it wouldn't, because it's an area not commonly open to the public in an owner-operated business, which is the daycare center. And if they have no employees, there's an exception. If they have an employee, they don't, they don't come under this exception. Is that correct? Uh, so I think arguably, though, arguably that is correct. I think if, as far as uh, what laws apply to a child care facility, these specifically apply to a child care facility. So given mm -hmm. that these are specific to the child care facility and those are general for the general population, these are the provisions that would prevail. And they say you can't Wh smoke. Which ones would? The so child, child care facility. So the ones that are specific to the child care facility are the ones that would govern what can happen at the child care facility. Okay, well, I, I think that should be referenced here so that people know it. Just, to me, if they have an employee, they're gonna, they're gonna not get that exception. They don't get any exception. Right. If you have There's, kids, right. if you're a child care facility and there are kids there. The kids are there. After the kids are out of there, they can smoke. I, I understand that. Oh, yeah. I understand. I helped write that bill. I know. It was just <laughs> last year. <laughs> but I'm just saying. And, and one one is law, and the other is a PowerPoint to share with with us and to point out things. To, uh, to, no, uh, no, it was Logan. Logan. Um, well, I was just a little curious. I know this one's a little long winded, but. Uh, on the second to last slide, you just mentioned that the, the state law does not restrict municipal smoking ordinances. And I was just curious what what power the law grants municipalities to regulate. Because, I'm going to send you to my colleague who knows municipal law. Right, yeah. um, yeah. Because of the Dillon rule and the, exactly. yeah, it's all yeah. complicated. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so I will yeah. have, if you're interested, I can have Tucker and talk with you. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I was curious. Yep. So I was just wondering, um, kind of off of a little bit of Chapter 33, but um, the rules that create the Commissioner of the Health, Department of Health, um, can they regulate products or substances that they deem harmful? So could the Commissioner say, this is harmful and shouldn't be allowed? I believe that is true. I will look to you guys, but they certainly do that with respect to, for example, um, illegal drugs. Um, they have kind of blanket authority to regulate things that are dangerous, but I'm not sure I can I can try to pull up that statute too. Uh, um, do you want to hear We're phoning friends. <laughs> yes. Hello, everyone. So again, for the record, Shayla Livingston from the Health Department. So we can look into the specifics of this, we do have a regulated drug rule that we work on with the Department of Public Safety and we try to update that every couple of years. Um, so things like synthetic cannabinoids are on, you know, in that list. Uh, I believe that they need to be Schedule 1 or otherwise illegal, but I can um, check that for you. And, and, and I believe that we explicitly give the Commissioner of Health the ability to do things by rule. Yes. That's and so correct. whether or not we explicitly in that we whether tobacco tobacco substitute things might be an other avenue. We all we we, we, we give um, commissioners across the board in many of our laws the ability to write rules. Right, the um, rules are to supplement Laws. Laws. So they can't conflict with statute. So 
statutes. And, and sometimes it's good to have statute. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's good to have rules. Topper. Um, I, I, I would think the commissioner, um, one of the, the first responsibility of the governor is to protect the people of the state of Vermont. So I would think that through that responsibility, the commissioner should have that power to protect the people of the state of Vermont. Okay. Um, are there other so that, uh, are, are there other questions? Isn't that a good way to answer that question? Um, are there other questions? Um, or are you finished? Yeah, I, I can pull up if you want to look at either yeah. the school sure. or the. All right, I'm gonna here again. And that is more responsive to your smoking in school question than. permitted to use tobacco products or tobacco substitutes on public school grounds or at public school sponsored functions and school boards can adopt policies that include confiscation and appropriate referrals to law enforcement authorities. That is all. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, uh, that's Gen C. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a window sill. Ah. I think we'll have a little chair shuffle here out this week. Um, committee, we're going to have um, Representative Till um, introduce his bill, and after that, um, we'll take a break, um, and then we'll have, I think Jen will do Benny Fun, uh, Representative Till's bill, we'll have Jen come back, and then Rebecca Ryan. We have you have helpers. So for the record, Representative George still from Jericho. Um, I'm here to talk about H26. Um, and um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for taking some testimony on this bill. Um, you know, in December. 2018, the Surgeon General did something that is pretty unusual, and that's that he put out an advisory um, about electronic cigarettes. And by electronic cigarettes, I'm talking about the whole range of different kinds from single use to <coughs> and, you know, the whole, the whole um, and, and what prompted him was a one year increase in utilization by high school students of 78%. That got the headlines. It also had a 47% increase on middle schoolers in one year. And he used the word, this is an epidemic. We need to do something, and we need to do something now. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we've been fighting this tobacco battle for 50 years, and we have been kind of winning. But this has the potential to completely reverse all the gains that we made. That rate of increase is really scary. So why is it scary? Because we know that how the teenage brains react to nicotine. They get addicted at an earlier, easier, um, e more easily than do adults at lower levels of nicotine and it's a more profound, um, it's a more profound addiction. We also know that kids who use electronic cigarettes are four times more likely to become tobacco, combustible tobacco users. They're also
also more likely to be users of other drugs from marijuana up to opiates. You know, it has to do with the brain changes in those nicotine receptors and the perception of um, pleasure from substances. And so, it, you know, this feeds into a whole lot of things that we're, we're worried about. Um, so, why would we target the online sales? You know, it, it, currently you can't ship tobacco and a kid can't go online and get tobacco shipped to their house. But they can with the e-cigarettes and the paraphernalia and the liquids with the e-cigarettes. Um, and right now the distribution is about a third, a third, a third, <coughs> a third people get their, um, their e-cigarettes at vape shops, a third get them at, at convenience stores, and a third get them online. <coughs> With tobacco, we know that you know the 18 to 20 year olds provide 90 percent of the tobacco to the younger teens. Um, it's not that high with uh, with e-cigarettes. It's only about 50 percent. And why is that? It's because the younger teens can go online and get them. How successful are they at um, getting them online? Well, one study out of North Carolina, the University of North Carolina, 93 percent of the time kids went on, they were able to get the get these cigarettes. Another study out of Connecticut after they passed the law trying to prohibit this sort of thing, um, it, still, it still was 86% went online and could get them. They've looked at how many of these online sites, they're supposed to have age verification. Um, and back in 2015, a study um, showed, uh, one study, there were three out of 120 sites that actually had useful age verification. Um, uh, another one showed um, that of the online vendors, about 61% had a pop-up that says, are you 18 or are you 21? And you just had to click that. That was it. 30% had, or 35% had none, no, no verification. Right. So 96% so no verification, real verification of age. And I, I thought that was crazy, but I tried it to a couple of sites over the weekend and sure enough I went to three sites, all three of them just had to click it. And that's, I mean, that's, that's not control and that's why, you know, kids just are going online and, and buying these things and having them shipped directly to them. So, you know, the, 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 the dramatic increase, the downstream effects in terms of tobacco um, addiction and tobacco usage and subsequent health problems related to that and this this ready availability um, online <coughs> are a real problem. Four other states have done this. Um, those, those states are um, Maine, South Dakota, Arkansas, and Utah. Um, they have all said no direct shipping of electronic <coughs> cigarettes. Um, I, I certainly have gotten a fair amount of hate mail about this. Um, I'm pretty, pretty uh, profane. Um, and, and it's from, there are people who um, do think these are smoking cessation devices. Uh, they're not. Um, the FDA has multiple uh, smoking cessation devices that they have approved. They have offered to the e-cigarette companies, if you believe you're a smoking cessation device, go through the process and be declared that. Not one has tried to do that. And the reason is that they're not <coughs> smoking cessation devices. They, yeah, what happens the majority of the time is people become dual users. So they do use the e-cigarettes, but they continue to use the regular cigarettes too. Um, and so, you know, I mean, the numbers of success with just using e-cigarettes alone is just, I mean, it's not statistically different than placebo. Um, so, so I'm confused. You're getting hate mail. Hate mail. But now, does this build? prohibit someone from an adult from buying e-cigarettes from James? Absolutely not. Them? Okay, so if you can still buy them. Still buy them. Uh, you know, my person was worried about being discreet about it. They so wanted to ship to their house. One person, uh, um, I mean, be more expensive. One of the arguments that you're getting. Yeah, yeah. Some people say they're more expensive. I mean, yeah. Affects the market more generally. Might make it a little more aggressive. So anyway, you know, we weigh we weigh 
you know, negative effects of what we do against the positive effects. And I think in the last year it's become increasingly clear that the positive effect of managing online sales is much more important than the convenience of somebody who is using them for um, trying to use them for smoking cessation. prohibited internet sales um, in general yes um, for for you and for phone sales, um, yes. do you do you happen to know when those laws went it, into it's effect all, it's all very recent oh, okay so so we don't have data at present data. as to how that is in the last couple of years I think two, six, 2016 okay. was the first I think. Um, do, do you have information as to um, the impact of reducing internet sales of cigarettes had on the use of cigarettes. You know, I, I haven't looked it up, but that was okay. a key piece of the fight. Yeah, but I haven't looked up the, okay. the, the numbers, but, okay. um, you know, and, and internet sales are a much more important thing right now than they were 20 years ago, obviously. It's a little bit different, uh, a little bit different landscape. Mm -hmm. um, Other, are there questions right now? This one, not, um, right now, for um, representative. Yes. This is more for Trevor. But do you? Uh, so, with the, the text as I read it, does this would this affect somebody generally being able to purchase like the battery pack, the power supply of the vaping product, yes. as that could technically be used for a non-tobacco. As long as it falls under the um, tobacco substitutes definition, which the components of these do, mm -hmm. uh, it would be able to buy them. But you could, I mean, in theory, you can buy these just for, for completely non nicotine and tobacco related purposes. It would affect. But it could be still labeled as a. Would it still labeled as a tobacco product? Yes, it would be. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, Are you sure you don't want to sit next to mom? Make sure she does okay? You can. You can. <laughs> you can. You so you Bring your chair over. Yeah, and ask your to move over. There you go. <laughs> can I take your picture? provision that we looked at earlier um, well it would actually add in two places so it would add tobacco substitutes liquids containing nicotine or otherwise intended for use with a tobacco substitute um, and paraphernalia it would prohibit anyone from engaging in the retail sale of those products unless that person is a licensed dealer or has purchased those items from a licensed wholesale dealer um, so that was an existing place where it seemed like some of our, our uh, in-state sale pieces weren't consistent and then it would add in the internet sales piece that no person mm -hmm. shall cause cigarettes roll your own tobacco little cigars snuff would add tobacco substitutes liquids containing nicotine or otherwise intended for use with a tobacco substitute or paraphernalia um, that was ordered online or by the phone to be shipped to anyone other than a licensed wholesale dealer or retail dealer in this state making some making the, some of the provisions regarding the sale of tobacco products um, consistent for electronic cigarettes tobacco paraphernalia and liquid nicotine and other uh, flavor you know the pods that go with the these uh, cigarettes and one page is really just the overview and the list of sponsors Can I ask a question that's not directly related to the language, but related to the topic? <laughs> Go right ahead. Um, I, I don't remember if you covered this or not. You might have covered it in your overview. Um, are, are these products, these tobacco substitute products, do um, you know if they are under the same uh, ban on advertising as cigarettes and tobacco products? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. I think all, I mean, all of that advertising stuff is at the federal level. Right. Um, so I don't know the extent to which they, I don't, I love. Oh, I was just gonna say, I, think I just read an article that they are not. Yeah, and I feel right. like you see ads for them in places that you no longer see ads for cigarettes, but that's anecdotal, I don't know if any of the advocates. So that's, just, that's a federal law? Yeah. Yes. As opposed to a state law. Yes. It is, but that doesn't mean we couldn't make a state law. Maybe. Well, I think there, I think we may be That's preempted it. in some of it. I have to look, but okay. I think there are there, there is some potential issue with federal preemption there. You okay. showed me online all the ads that come through when he's online from because it's yeah. He's come it's it. it was it just blew me away. I'm uh, I'm gonna look to our store expert. Uh, yeah. I mean you can't put in, like tobacco um, things on your door. Yeah, for sure. Oh, you can. Yeah. Oh, I thought there were. I put a big old sign outside if I want to, but I don't want to get shot. So. <laughs> oh, okay. So what? I, I, oh, did we try to do that and we got preempted? I think there was some talk about that. I think there certainly um, can be First Amendment issues with restricting commercial speech okay. for lawful products. What we do, we have a bill with this. Yes, we have a sign law. Yeah. Um, but that's sort of a time, place, and oh, manner okay. restriction. Okay. Yeah. That's the word it's not a bill. It's the content. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this would be regulating content. Mm -hmm. huh. um, but I can look more. Well, okay. We can also add a little bit more information about it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know the TV stuff. I, you know, this is. I, I, for some reason, I thought 
that there were things around the counter and what you could have on the counter in terms of um, tobacco. That's the The product itself. The pro right. But not the, not the, not not the, the advertisement. Yeah. Okay. You can't do anything that's um, seemingly targeted at minors, which I mean, that's national stuff. But okay. You can have some, this is, we have Marlboro, 899 back or whatever. Okay. Sandwiches. Uh, closer to my store, closer to the Carl. Just on the top of page two, where it's uh, you know an act relating to restricting retail and internet sales of electronic cigarettes. I thought this was limited to internet sales, but it talks about retail. Right. So that's the prohibition in section one on engaging in the retail sale of these products unless the person is a licensed wholesaler. Um, or has, or, has purchased them, or has purchased them from a licensed wholesaler. So I'm, I, I'm a licensed. I'm licensed. I'm a licensed retailer. So somebody at um, this is within all the shops, right? Yeah. They want to sell cigarettes. They can't do it until they get licensed. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. And this would say that nobody can engage in the retail sale of these products unless they're a licensed dealer or has purchased them from a licensed from a, I'm sorry from a licensed wholesaler yes. or purchased them from a licensed wholesaler. So the so, licensed so retailers. So we're extending that now to internet exactly. sales. So the licensed so retailers. I was looking at it. It was going the other way, but we're extending that now to internet sales, right? Right, and so that that's uh, so that would mean that a retailer couldn't <coughs> purchase those products online and then sell them in mm -hmm. Vermont either. Like you can't even you, like I can't go to another another convenience store or grocery store and buy cigarettes and sell them. You have to buy them through a license wholesale. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you could you can't go to Costco. You can, but they're a license wholesale. Oh, okay. okay. You can go to but you can't buy alcohol there. Yes. No, I know. They do that in the clubs too. They go to Costco. Right, because Costco is a license, license wholesale, wholesale, as opposed to just a yeah. store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't go to the gallery and get something and say, "I'm short this week. I need some. I ran out. Don't want customers run out." And the Indians can't sell it to you either. Not from resale. You can buy as an individual. Yes. What, I mean, this is just off, off of this mm -hmm. bill, but I was just curious. We are talking about, uh, you know, how people do different things. But it seemed to me it was a popular thing I heard about anyway, that people would go to the uh, casino, uh, Indian yeah. Yeah, you can. casino. Buy cigarettes, and then uh, apparently they don't have something to do with the taxes on stamp. the government. Hmm? It's but stamp. it's illegal to do that, right? And people would then try to resell those cigarettes, and that would be <coughs> illegal. Once you, you resell them, what's that? You can't resell them. Yeah. You can buy them. Right. But I mean, some people did sell them, yes. so it was illegal to do that. Okay. okay. Uh, in terms of the enforcement part of this, on the monitoring part of this. Um, it was mentioned that the Attorney General's office is responsible for that. The internet sales piece. Yeah. So, I'm assuming the enforcement is the same way. So, for the internet sales piece, yes. For the retailer piece, I believe it is the Department of the enforcement will be the same as they are. They just added this. Yes, these are fitting into the existing statutes, uh, just adding the electronic cigarettes right. and, and related products um, to the current prohibitions that are regulated by the respective regulatory. Okay, so does it say that someplace? That the Attorney General does that? Yeah, that's what I want to look for. Some place or some place that's not? Some places just bill. Don't say in the bill. I guess. No, because I'm only amending a piece of it. Yeah. Um, so this is right. So this is internet sales, um, and then there. Attorney General yeah. may seek So violate right. So violation is punishable as follows. In addition to anything else, the Attorney General can impose a civil penalty. Each shipment or transport is a separate violation. Attorney General can seek an injunction. State is entitled to. What does it say the Attorney General will, will three. regulate? Two and three. So two and three. Two says 
in addition to and in lieu of any other crime or civil or criminal remedy provided by law upon a determination that a person has violated the section, the attorney general may impose a civil penalty in an amount not to exceed $5,000. And in number three, the attorney general may seek an injunction. Uh, and then the attorney general's office also um, enforces the state's Consumer Protection Act. So that's number five. If anybody makes money on it, that goes into the general fund. Uh, and, and before we go to questions, I, Topper, this, this, and we'll continue on this. Topper, what you've presented to us, I think, is a good learning, which is when we have a bill that is amending an existing statute, for instance, it does not have the entire underlying, underlying statute. So sometimes we have to go back to the which is what Jen is doing for us now, going back to the underlying statutes to get the answers to our questions. Teresa and then Carl. Oh, uh, one, sorry, were you not finished? I'm, 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 I just have one request now. I, I've read that. Okay. And um, I think what we should do is get something from the Attorney General saying on this new piece that's here that um, his office is going to monitor this. Because it doesn't talk about that. It talks about what he'll do if somebody does something. Okay. Um, Jen, would you flip up in that section um, to the definition section? So I, I'm just wondering if we do we need to have anything there? Okay, so no, it's covered. at the beginning, they're defined for the whole chapter. So in the definition section and at the beginning of the chapter, it has, as used in this chapter, and this is where we have definitions of tobacco products, tobacco paraphernalia, and tobacco mm -hmm. substitutes. Substitutes, yeah. okay, all right. So it's a little confusing. They seem to be defined again in right, certain that's terms. Saying. And actually, the terms that are being defined there, they're, they're pulling in the definitions from the tax statutes. Okay. Um, and so, so something for, to perhaps look at is the consistency between this and the tax statute. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, a lot of the tax statutes refer back to chapter or to title seven so um i guess that's what was confusing me i was trying to figure out why there were additional definitions in the section that we're amending or that we're discussing yeah and i don't really the only thing i can think is if maybe these were originally codified somewhere else and moved um i'm not really sure why somebody did it that way when this was originally enacted it wasn't me so i can't speak to the but we like consistency. And we do, we love consistency. So I'm happy to make any changes you would like to achieve consistency. Carl. Oh. Um, not specifically on this, but uh, as far as are we going to hear from the Vermont Retailers Association on their position on this bill? And so I just thought it'd be useful to hear. Uh, obviously, it, a very compelling case has been made by the commissioner. And this is trying to address a portion of it. So I'm not saying that, you know, I just think it would be appropriate well, that we have the Retailers ab Association. Ab um, absolutely. Okay. Um, right. Or some similar group, but somebody. Yeah, no, no, um, yes, um, and Carl, thank you for bringing that up. The next item on our agenda is committee discussion. Mm -hmm. um, committee discussion around this in terms of various decisions to make or not make. After a bit. Oh, sorry, after Rebecca. So, sorry. Um, so, so, yes. Um, and having looked at this a little more, I do want to answer your question. I think that the definitions are in here because while we use the terms cigarettes, oil or tobacco, things like that, in the definition of tobacco products, the terms themselves are not actually defined there. They're defined as far as what is a cigarette, what is snuff, um, and because Subsection B is only calling out certain parts of what makes up tobacco products. The cigarettes, roll your own tobacco, little cigars, and snuff. There are more perfect, there are more examples in the tobacco products definition than just those. Um, it, it does make sense, I think, to have those terms defined. So then that, that leads me back to my original question is whether we needed a definition here, then if those are being called out specifically for their use in this chapter because well, so when we have the definitions for the whole chapter, they don't include an actual definition of cigarette, for example. Um, even though, so one possibility could be to move 
those definitions into the overall chapter definitions actually which might make some sense. But, um, but as far as this bill, all we're doing is locking in and we're to and adding this G to seven. So everything else is still there, so the definitions still exist. The definitions so that are in existing in ten seven BSA ten ten are still, still there. They're not going away. Um, Non-standalone bills are Okay. In terms of what we do or don't do, can we not get into that discussion yes. right now? Yes, no, I'm, I, I'm, I think so. Com the, I'm confused as, I, I guess I've not been, I feel more confused than I did when I started my class. Sorry. Um, I think one thing to, to note is that not all tobacco products are subject to that prohibition on internet sales. So you can order cigars through the over the internet, through the mail, they could be shipped to people in Vermont, that's okay, but cigarettes are not. Right, so th th that is where I had come to in my head, and I'm thinking like, well, why? And th that's... Because kids don't smoke from cigars? I don't know. I feel um, um, Are there other questions around content? Yeah, not about what we should or shouldn't do, but content on what the bill has introduced no, no. says. No. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, and Rebecca. And, and, and Jen, I think you need to share some of your hourly salary. Oh, I can hear Um, Jen, you have to, we have two people on the side who can help. Yeah, we're, we're the oh, designated tech. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be more than one again. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Sleeping on the job again, you should. Take it over the way. You must have been wondering your relevance. Yeah, it's yeah. serious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. That's, yeah. no. I'm Rebecca Ryan. I'm Rebecca Ryan with the American Lung Association. Thanks for your time today. I'm going to be very brief. Um, Dr. Levine presented compelling and comprehensive uh, information on the public health impacts of electronic cigarettes. Um, this is my formal testimony. There's a couple points from this I want to make. It's one, we advocate and we know the most effective ways to reduce tobacco use is one, um, comprehensive, fully funded tobacco control program. And part of that is um, enforcement of youth access laws, such as we talked about today. Um, two is clean indoor air laws. And you heard from Jen and Dr. Levine, we have very um, strong laws to protect people from secondhand smoke and secondhand emissions. And then the third is high um, tobacco taxes. Um, and there are eight states currently, plus DC, that actually um, Cigarettes. Um, Vermont is not one of those, so that's an opportunity. You raise the pack price by 10% um, equivalents for other tobacco products. That's the most effective way to deter you from starting to use those products. Um, and then we're also supporting um, a, a, the emerging best practice, which is raising the age of sales of tobacco. Um, these are all just statistics that Dr. Levine cited this morning. I won't um, talk about those unless anybody has any questions. I have um, resources that we offer on our website. You can click on any one of those links and you can see more information. Um, but what I want to focus on is that last, the last link. It's a New York Times article from November 2018. Um, and it's called The Price of Cool, A Teenager, A Jewel, and a Nicotine Addiction. And um, it's really chilling. I've, um, I, I would encourage you to take the time to read it, but it's about a student that was actually um, from Massachusetts, a high school student who started dueling um, at the age of 16. He enrolled in UVM as an 18-year-old. And I just want to read um, a short clip from that article. Um, Matt said it drew, drew a pleasing minty moistness into his mouth, so he uh, clearly liked the mint-flavored um, jewel. Then he held it, kicked it to the back of his throat, let it balloon into his lungs. Blinking in astonishment at the euphoric power punch of nicotine, he felt it, that he would later refer to as the head rush. Now he's 19 years old. Um, he's no longer using, but he said, um, 
It was love at first puff. <clears throat> as a student, he said at UVM, he used a pod, which as you learn from Dr. Levine, is about a pack of cigarettes a day with nicotine, um, or more every day. And he reported that a girl in his dorm hall sold jewel pods from a stock she had bought from a guy who ordered arm loads on the internet. So, you know, it's anecdotal, but that's kind of describing what um, Dr. Levine said is happening around these e-cigarettes. Um, and then from a, um, the assistant pr principal from U32, she said that she knows of a parent who received a sh shipment of electronic cigarettes at home and I didn't order these. Um, her son did with the help of, a, of an adult friend. Um, so they're, bur they're buying them online whether they're, you know, um, uh, whether the site is checking for age or not, um, they're getting around that. Um, I know of a 12-year-old that was caught with Jewel multiple times in the school. She was expelled, and now she's being homeschooled. Um, in Franklin Grand Isle, from one of our community partners, she said the story she hears over and over again that kids are buying um, gift cards, Visa gift cards, cash cards, and then ordering things on eBay um, and then Walmart. So they're figuring out ways to get um, and then from a pulmonologist in, in Newport, she said it's really easy buying a Walmart gift card and purchasing, purchasing these online. So those are just some of the stories that are happening around the state. This is actually the, <coughs> this is the door Dr. Levine was talking about this, this morning, the principal's door. This is a confiscation from the school in Franklin Grand Isle of uh, just a, a day. Did you pass that over? Oh, sure. For those of us with bad eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think those are the, the main points I wanted to make um, without duplicating this morning's testimony. And so the Bond Association, um, we support this bill. And we, we in, in an effort to make sure that electronic cigarettes are treated like other tobacco products and cigarettes in the state just extending this law makes sense. Is the age 21, the other age is 18. Increasing the age to 21, that's correct. You know, for, that. for all tobacco. That's a different bill. Mm -hmm. uh, not that people can't amend things. Uh, um, Rebecca, did you have uh, data around um, what the impact is on? Um, teenagers for increasing the price through applying tax on this? You, you said it, it reduced, that was the, a deterrent, but do you have any data about um, that? I, we can probably look to Minnesota. It's had the electronic cigarette tax the longest, and it would, I know that the proposals that have been um, introduced in this building are um, look, trying to um, tax electronic cigarette liquid the same as other tobacco products, which would be 92% Mm -hmm. Minnesota's is similar, it's 95%, so I could look at that and see what that mm -hmm. has done as a deterrent. Right. I think yes. that would be the, the probably the best example. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So, so committee, um, your um, agenda planning group <coughs> in sort of trying to mix up both introduction and also let's get working on bills. We did not have tons of bills on our wall. And um, this was one, and there seems to be several bills related to electronic cigarettes that have been. So um, my first question is, do you want to, um, are you willing and interested to, pers to pers thank you, to continue, pursue, um, <laughs> Um, taking testimony um, on this bill. Yes. 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 Um, um, well, I was just suggesting we yeah, um, from the Retailers Association for sure do that for us. Probably, but I'd like yeah. an overall. I don't know the doctors as a whole, but the people I've talked to decided. Um, say so, because it's going to be people. Yeah, it's going to I'd like the pictures for consumers in general. I think that idea is just there. They have a different problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I am very interested in pursuing the topic. Yeah. Um, I guess I would like to see what the other, if there are there other bills going to be coming to our committee <coughs> the, about this? Uh, the, or? Um, uh, mirroring the uh, 
tobacco tax mm -hmm. is downstairs. Right. And um, in ways and means. Okay. And isn't there another bill? Mm -hmm. there? The 18th. Oh, and, and moving the 18, 18 to 21. 21 that's all it, tobacco products. Then that's all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. And I know that was it. Has it has it been introduced in the House? We, we have. It. Oh, yeah. we have it. Yeah. Okay, and we have it. Yeah, we're for so. Okay, so I mean, those are. Okay. Um, so. so what you're um, referring to. Okay. Yeah. So um, we don't get we don't get the tax implications, obviously. Um, okay. So I, the answer is yes, then for me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Tapra has said, um, wanted to hear from the AG. Um, the Vermont retailers, um, a consumer. Um, we have all sorts of people around the room. Who else would like to testify? Those of you who are representing clients who have an interest? <laughs> Maggie? We may, but I don't feel like I'm authorized to say that. I need to catch up with my team first. Okay. Same as Maggie, got to check in with the books. If you have an interest, if they have an interest and will be communicating with members of the legislature about this bill, I will expect them to testify. Okay. <laughs> Understood. If they have no position, fine. But I mean, that's what the committee process is all about because yeah. maybe we'll make amendments. Absolutely. Thank you. We take testimony, and people who um, have different opinions than maybe the, va the vast majority of the committee, I make them come in and testify uh, <laughs> because we, you know, they put another view on it, and they may in fact shift our opinion. And the only time, in my recollection, that we have done something um, the same day that we have introduced it um, was probably close to 20 years ago when the federal government. Um, did Medicaid Part D, and it would have impacted under um, Governor Douglas, <clears throat> and it negatively was impacting the prescription drug benefit for senior Vermonters. And we started a bill, and it went through the entire process um, to the Senate, right, to the governor's desk in a week. No, or less. no, it was a day. It was, okay, maybe it was a day. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 yes, we, we passed it in a day, and he signed it the next month. Things move slow until they have to move fast. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the only time, and that was, you know, um, every. I mean, this was trying to to protect a group of individuals who whose benefit was being taken away. Um, yeah. Um, so um, we will we will put this on the agenda um, <clears throat> in the next couple of weeks. You know, depending upon where we are in terms of things, but we will begin to move forward on that. Um, uh, tomorrow, in the interest of um, bringing, we're not coming back today because we have the government, right? 
Right, because we have the governor's um, budget address. Um, tomorrow, when we get off the floor, um, we're taking up an introduction of a bill that will be brought to our committee today. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> um, and uh, then in the afternoon, I think there is some so it's a couple of bills. a couple of bill introductions, and those will be um, what I call the um, speed dating, which is uh, you know in other words um, the concept of the the uh, the proposers will explain their bill, and then we can come back. As we start to get more bills, we can't do all of them on the, um, and give, you know, we have, we'll begin to have to make decisions as to where we put our energy, and we get to then know about these. So that's what will happen um, on Friday. Um, I would, if we are interested in, we are interested in pursuing, um, looking at this legislation, I would love folks to, um, maybe read the New York Times, I mean, to, to um, look more in depth. I don't want to assign them. I'm sorry, I'm teaching at UVM tomorrow afternoon or something, so. Um, but to look at some of the links, um, which are for data, which um, Rebecca gave us, um, and things like that. Other questions? Thanks. Did this work? Good in terms of having um, the commissioner give a overview. Um, and next week, um, he gets to come back um, for more of a what? What is the health department? Um, because actually, it's sort of the health department has a lot of varied things, and so we'll be taking. Um, so we'll be continuing that um, sort of what is state government. Uh, within our committee, we'll be taking up more testimony, and Julie keeps getting um, requests, more testimony um, around H57, um, and people can always submit uh, their testimony, uh, their comments, and we will post all comments in all letters that we get on our, um, so that people can be, um, can be heard. What else is on our Oh, and we're going to the movies next Friday. Oh, awesome. All right. Um, it's in room 11. <laughs> um, but another issue, um, sort of in terms of non specific bill right now, but another issue that we um, have spent a lot of time in this committee about in previous years that touches education, health care, and everything else is um, trauma or resiliency or um, adverse childhood experiences. Um, and there is a sort of an introduction or a film that's about half an hour that's being, um, that we're joining a boatload of committees in room 11 um, on Friday morning. That's next Friday. No. That's next, yeah, that's next Friday. Um, so make sure you have your badges, because the people around here asking for badges. I've lost mine already. What? No, I mean, I, you know, I had it, I had it 15 minutes ago. I think you're safe if you stay in the building. I know, but I mean, what are I just doing? You have your name tag on. Uh, okay, and so I will see you. Um, I apologize. I will be out. I will. Um, Sandy, Sandy will be in charge, and um, uh, and Sandy's tomorrow. not. The and Sandy's not there. It will be time. You're for illustrious. Well, yes, we'll, we'll take care of it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to a hotel. Yes. Safe trap. Really. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to the National Council of State Legislators. Um, I'm learning about maternal child health and sort of adverse childhood events and things like that. And, and your return date is when? Um, Sunday at 10 p.m. Oh. Uh, I thought you were taking a little time off. I, I tried to. you're in a place where you could. I know. I know. So I say I'm going to a hotel. I'm going to New Orleans, but I don't think I'm going to see anything in New Orleans. Are you leaving tonight? No, I'm leaving at um, 6.20 tomorrow morning. Oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a nice